So welcome everyone to um, our uh, IHW Cross Research Theme Seminar. I'm going to wait one more minute to um, wait for more people to join and then we make a start. So I see we have um, 33 participants so far with, I guess, four speakers, uh, three speakers and me. So that's 30 people um, joining. And the numbers go up, which is great. <laughs> okay, so then I make a slide. So welcome to the, um, the first IH Cross Research Theme Seminar of the year, 2021. Um, and my name is um, Anne Martin. I'm a research fellow at the um, C MRC, MRC CSO Social Public Health Science Unit. And um, the first seminar in that series is always dedicated to early career researchers. And um, our early career researchers are going to present their work around COVID um, that has dominated um, our private and uh, research life um, a lot, I guess, in the last year. And so our first presenter is um, Alessia Albanese. He's based at the General Practice, and he will be talking about public understanding of the test and protect um, system and it's a qualitative report and the second speaker is Hannah Burnett who's based at the um, SPHS here and she will be exploring the use and experience of green space during the initial restrictions on movement in the UK and then um, a final talk is um, by um, Marie Kutsur who is a research associate at the um, mental health and well-being um, Group and her research is on health and well-being implications of physical distancing restrictions in Scotland, a qualitative study. And um, I ask you to keep your microphone muted throughout the seminar and to switch off your cameras just for bandwidth. Um, and you please ask questions in the chat box, or put them in, write them in while the talks are ongoing. And I will be reading out your questions. Um, after each presenter finished their talk. And yeah, so this session is being um, recorded so that we can make it available to anyone who cannot join this session live um, later on. So now I'd like to, um, um, yeah, have um, Alessio uh, sharing his screen and um, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm going to, quickly share my screen and introduce myself. So, does everybody see my screen being shared? So, hi everyone, my name is Alessio Albanese. I am a PhD student in the Department of General Practice and Primary Care and a psychological therapist based in a deep uh, GP practice in Glasgow. Today, I'd like to present some of the work that we conducted last summer just after the first lockdown. And the work I am um, about to present is called We All Have a Part to Play, uh, which explores public um, and key um, informants perspectives on test and protect program in Scotland. This work is led by Professor Kate O'Donnell. Um, so the rationale for this work is that contact tracing um, is essential for us to control outbreaks of infectious disease. Um, uh, COVID-19 is not the first example of contact tracing being um, applied. There have been previous examples with, uh, for example, the HIV outbreak or um, sexual uh, infections outbreaks. Um, it is understood that uh, testing, tracing and isolating is uh, required to ease the, the, the lockdown related to, to COVID-19 and that digital approaches are seen as fundamental for it to be achieved. This work was commissioned actually by the uh, digital, Health, digital Health Institute and Public Health Scotland, and we undertook um, a rapid qualitative exploration of uh, key stakeholders and uh, public perspectives. So the methods that we've used were a mixture of one-to-one -one interviews and focus groups 
The number of participants were 29 in total, 13 of which were key informants. Um, 21 people were women, eight were men, uh, nine of which uh, came from minority ethnic communities and six from the uh, Scottish Asian community. The vast majority of people were middle-aged, 18, and only three were under 30 and eight over 60. Um, there were a mixture of working and retired people, which included um, care home workers and nurses, and um, at least five people were living with multiple chronic conditions and or disabilities. So we tried to kind of engage as broad, um, as broad a sample as possible, um, uh, given the restrictions in terms of numbers. The, the recruitment happened through uh, existing community networks that uh, we had within the department. Um, all interviews and focus groups, of course, were conducted via Zoom due to restrictions. Some of the cities from which the participants came were Glasgow, Aberdeen, and, and Dundee. Some were from the central belt and some from remote areas. So some of the key themes that were uncovered through the um, interviews and focus groups were information, digital access and literacy, data governance and privacy, uh, following rules and guidance, and some of the perceived challenges. So in relation to information, most of the participants, regardless of age, gender, or where they lived, um, had some knowledge of uh, the Test and Protect program. Um, information was derived from a variety of sources, including Scottish government leaflet, um, people searching on information online, and from the daily briefings by the Scottish government. Um, there were, however, some confusions in relation to the program um, between the program in Scotland and in England, and this was with this was most evident around discussions on the tracing app, and in particular NHSX, the proximity app that was developed down south. One of the participants, a middle-aged female, said that uh, I'm a bit confused about test and protect. So you hear uh, the scheme is doing well, and then it's not doing well, uh, and it's being launched down south. So I'm quite confused about it. Participants did not mention receiving info about Test and Protect on TV, radio, on social media. Social media was a bit um, surprising as we um, initially expected that more information would have been shared on social media and people would have, come, would have become acquainted with uh, Test and Protect through social media services. So then another thing that came up was digital access and literacy. Almost all of the participants had an Android or an Apple smartphone and all were regular users of the internet. Most had no issue with using digital tools or website, either on their smartphone, tablet, or, or laptop. This was one of the limitations of the sampling, of course, because the participants that we had were mainly middle, middle class and mostly uh, younger people, middle-aged. Um, and therefore it's more likely that they use the internet and be more acquainted with digital tools. However, some commented that their elderly parents would, um, would probably prefer telephone communication in relation to the Test and Protect program. This was a particular issue that was raised uh, within focus groups with the uh, South Asian uh, participants who discussed the, the lack of digital literacy among older um, Asian people. Thus, telephone was most appropriate. Um, there was an issue related to it nonetheless, which was that if the phone call related to, 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 to test results, for example, or, or having been in contact with someone who was tested positive was given to a no caller ID, then people may be wary, as one middle-aged female pointed out uh, about answering such a call. Then data governance and privacy, Whilst most interviewees and focus group participants were trusting of the process, particularly because it was NHS led, they had trust in the NHS um, in Scotland, several participants commented on the need to be clear about how long the data are stored and who has access to that data. Some participants um, wanted reassurance that the data would be passed, would not be passed on to a third party or sold on, and some concerns were raised by both men and women, younger and older participants. In relation to the, the specific confidentiality statement that is present within the website version um, of, of this tool, um, participants mentioned that these should be expanded 
to say that this information will not be used outside the NHS and not be given to a third party. A lot of people will have notions in their head about things being sold. This is a quote from our middle-aged uh, female participant um, in the interview. Um, key informant working with asylum seekers also mentioned that there would be awareness from, from this particular population group um, in disclosing personal information due to distrust in the home office, which could potentially be the result of the hostile environment. Uh, some of the perceived challenges that people had mentioned uh, were in relation to self-isolation, particularly getting shopping delivered was, was challenging, um, and some participants relied on community help and community groups to help them to pick up their medication or, or their food supplies. Um, the description of self-isolation was um, mentioned as quite scary by one older female participant, particularly for those that lived alone, uh, but they also talked about being reticent to ask strangers for help and not feeling confident uh, asking a stranger for help. Uh, the impact of self-isolation also was described in relation to people's mental health and well-being. Um, and, and this was particularly mentioned in relation to having to potentially isolate more than once. Uh, another participant also recognized that while she had friends and family who could support her in isolation, this is not the case for everybody who may not have the same support. Some of the perceived challenges were also related to financial implications. Um, so this was a concern for people's ability to be able to self-isolate if required. Some of the uh, specific barriers um, included loss of earnings, uh, uh, people on zero hour contracts and precarity of employment. Uh, one younger female mentioned that it would be difficult for people on zero hour contracts and I'm thinking of my friends who are on zero hour contracts or in jobs that would um, probably want them to go to work uh, and they didn't have sick pay. So the Scottish government, another participant mentioned, should do more to make sure that there are social services in place and health workers um, in place to support people who have to stay at home and isolate. Another perceived challenge was contact tracing. Several participants worried about remembering who they had been in contact with. And sometimes the, the, the specific guidelines on what, gen, what, what would be a contact um, were not fully understood. Um, and sometimes people would also think that there are members in their community who would be ashamed to disclose um, having come in contact with, with COVID-19. Also disclosing of contacts was difficult um, if people were, for example, or had been involved in illegal activities, or if they did not follow government's rules during lockdown. Participants also mentioned willingness to discuss uh, disclosure with contacts before naming them, particularly if these are uh, family members or close friends, uh, before, before naming them in, in relation to having to pass on contacts in case of a positive result. There was some discussion also on the meaning of a negative test, because some participants assumed that negative test results meant you did not have COVID regardless of presenting symptoms. However, at the time of the interview, there was a potentially high rate of false negatives of up to 30%. So having a negative test does not mean necessarily you're negative. Um, um, and it, it was also highlighted that this information needed to be better explained to the public. So basically, what is it that we found in this first, um, first study related to um, test and protect? That the Scottish uh, government is daily briefings were the main source of information for participants. Um, the nature of the sample, of course, um, provides a certain picture about uh, people's understanding. Most of our participants were digitally literate and quite confident to come forward and talk about their experiences. And, um, also, they've, they've, they've um, um, expressed concern about inequality and, and digital access for, for other members of their communities who might not have been interviewed. Um, there was little concern about data sharing, aside from a few points that were, that were clearly made within the interviews. But the Scottish NHS, NHS by and large, inspired trust. Also, in terms of compliance, we found overwhelming support for measures and a high sense of civic responsibility. 
um, intended personal compliance uh, was high with guest and protect rules, um, less sure about sharing contacts, as we mentioned in the previous slides, there was a reluctance to apportion blame if, for example, somebody couldn't um, self-isolate for financial reason or, or, or for housing problems. And, and these uh, practical difficulties were understood. Uh, so the conclusions are that there has been an excellent PR from the Scottish government, particularly in relation, of course, this is, this is in relation to the first lockdown, uh, there was high levels of civic engagement. The personal interpretation of rules was considered important and the fast paced change in context and information given was pointed out within the interviews and potentially something to look next would be to look at next would be the first versus second lockdown, whether there are any differences. And this is ongoing work of which I am not a part. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please um, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Alessio, for the really, really interesting and clear presentation. So, yeah, please um, write your questions in the um, chat box. And okay. while you do so, I um, have a question for you. See, can you say a bit more? Because the study was very much in the beginning of the, happened in the beginning of the, the lockdown, the first lockdown and the whole COVID uh, pandemic. Can you tell us a bit about the research process? So were you involved in collecting the data and how was it speaking, like recruiting and then speaking to people about this um, topic? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your question. Yes, I was involved in the, uh, in the recruitment and um, or I played a part in the recruitment and I played a part in the data collection. And actually, I was very surprised at how much people were willing to participate and, and discuss their experiences and, and willing to help. And I felt that there was a very strong sense of civic responsibility in relation to the virus and, and um, a sense of community in, in relation to trying to find out as much as possible and making sure that people that needed most help were brought to the fore really within the interviews so it was very 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 interesting to see and very um uh, i would say very positive to see this, this this approach from people great thank you i'm just having a look at the chat ah so lawrence uh, moore is asking is alessia aware of other studies in the uk or internationally um, that have found similar or different findings or experiences? This is a very, a very good question, Lawrence. Thank you for asking. In fairness, um, I, I do not know of any other studies because uh, for me, the participation in the study was very much about um, uh, recruiting and collecting data. And then I basically went back to my PhD. So my PhD is in mental health and, and common mental health issues in asylum seekers and refugees. So I took a detour to, to help with this study at that time. But if you like, I could ask the, the lead author of, of the study, Professor uh, Kate O'Donnell, and get back to you if, with more information. Um. Thanks, Alessio. Um, not aware of, of anything, certainly not published. A couple of small reports, but there's been very little published. Uh, and we're in the process of writing up the work at the moment, Lawrence. Okay, thank, thank you, Kate, for, for chipping in there. <laughs> um, we have another question from uh, Sharon. So do you have plans to engage with government to share your findings to inform future contact tracing implementation that might have been done already. Do you know? Uh, I, I, yes, uh, definitely there are, um, there was a white paper that was submitted um, with the results of the study uh, from which um, the presentation that I, that I have given um, draws on. So yes, th th there is, and, and given that Kate is here, she could, perhaps confirm that there are plans to, to, to share the findings with, with government agencies. 
Okay, please go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, my, my typing's not fast enough with my one hand at the moment. Um, yes, um, obviously, as Alessio has said, he, he went back to work in his PhD, but we have continued to engage with um, Digital Health and Care Institute and Public Health Scotland. Uh, so the work has informed how they've developed their online testing tools, and that's the second piece of work that we're now about to evaluate and how that's being used and how that's helping contact tracers do their work. So it's it's been good from that point of view to see the work that Alessio and Susan and the others have done actually has been used um, as, as the process has been developing over the last few months. Okay, thank you. So there's time for one more question that I'm reading out to Les. I see loads of interest. <laughs> um, um, Ali Trainer asked, um, was there any mention from participants regarding the impact of fake information on their information understanding? So fake information from social media or other sources in terms of fake NHS numbers in terms of contacting mm. people? Not, not really that, that came to the fore, no. I, I don't think that was something that preoccupied participants particularly. Okay, thank you. You see also other questions in the chat, so you can also respond directly in the chat. And I say we move on to um, Hannah's talk. So thank you very much, Alessia, for a really thank interesting you. presentation. Thank you for listening. Um, and Hannah, you can share your screen and present your work on exploring the use and experiences of green space during the initial restrictions on movement in the UK. Thank you. So I'm testing out um, the subtitles today to so see how they hold up with me whizzing through these slides. Um, so yeah, I'm Hannah Burnett, a PhD student at the Social and Public Health Sciences Unit at the University of Glasgow, um, supervised by Rich Mitchell and John Olson. And today I'll be discussing results from a survey exploring use and experiences of green space during the initial restrictions on movement in the UK. So. I thought it's important to start off by explaining why green space research is needed and also what green space actually is. So in this survey, we defined, we defined green spaces as places outside of your home where you can see and experience plants, trees and nature, for example, public parks, nature reserves or woodland areas. And there's been some existing research that's found that green spaces can promote social contact, stress reduction, self-satisfaction and positive peer relationships. I've put a couple of quotes from existing natural experiments on the right hand side of this um, slide that emphasise the influence that green space can have on health and wellbeing. And these findings support the idea of green space being used as a nature based intervention in the public health system. However, many existing studies have measured green space access, for example, whether you live within 15 minutes of a local park rather than actual use of green space. So whether someone actively goes out and uses the green space that's around them. So I think the importance of this research has been accentuated further by the current COVID-19 pandemic. And during the first lockdown, the UK population were only allowed out for limited purposes, including to exercise once a day, um, which you probably remember well. And the UK government recognised the value of access to urban green space, requiring councils to keep parks open during the lockdown. I think this emphasises the importance placed on these spaces last year. And we must understand the effect of the lockdown on green space use and how this differed between demographic groups in order to generate policy recommendations for governments in any future lockdowns, including the one that we find ourselves in now. I think these headlines highlight how green space has become a key part of many people's lockdown experiences as they emphasize why conducting research on green space is important in the context of the pandemic. For example, how have behaviors changed throughout the past year of COVID-19 and what are the impacts of this on the population's well-being? So we conducted a survey via UCOV um, during the first lockdown and this was administered from the 30th of April to the 1st of May 2020 and we had 2,252 respondents from the UK GB omnibus of 800,000 panellists and this was a nationally representative sample of the UK population. So as I said, this was during the first lockdown or the stay at home phase where the population were permitted to leave home for very limited purposes and this included exercising once a day on your own or with members of your household. And on this slide, I've put a list of the questions that we asked in this first survey. And those in blue are the ones I'll be discussing the results of today. 
So participants were asked whether they'd used green space in the year before restrictions on movement were implemented, whether they used green space following the first lockdown being implemented from the 23rd of March, if their green space use had changed during the first lockdown so that they'd increased, decreased or had no difference in their use of green space. And if they had visited green space, they were asked how their change in experience during lockdown had changed compared to before lockdown. And if they hadn't visited, they were asked how their barriers to use had changed. And we also collected a variety of demographic data. So for the analysis, we started off by running some descriptive statistics in R, which included counts and percentages. And this led to us changing some of the demographic categories, um, including for ethnicity and age, either for ease of analysis or to ensure the base sample was over 50. So at the bottom of this slide, I've put a table of the demographic data that I'll be discussing today. So this included sex, social grade, which was measured by occupation, um, age, ethnicity, which we had to categorize into white, which included white British and any other white ethnic group, and then black, Asian and minority ethnic group or BAME, and then dog ownership. And we ran weighted binary logistic regression models. So first we did individual models. So running each of the demographic variables on their own per question. And then we combined them all into adjusted logistic regression models. And we also ran some interaction effects between each of these variables for each model. However, I'm not able to um, explain these results today due to the limited time, but we did run those as well. So for each of these slides, I've got a predicted probability plot in the middle with an odds ratio interpretation below it for those that prefer a percentage. Um, and at this top, there is a descriptive statistic. So starting off with um, looking at whether participants visited green space in the year before movement restrictions were enforced in the UK, 93% of the participants had visited green space in the year before lockdown. And this was statistically significantly associated with ethnicity and social grade. So you can see that BAME respondents were less likely to have visited green space before the lockdown um, compared to white participants and those in the lower social grade group were less likely to have visited than those in the higher social grade group. And then looking at how this changed after the lockdown, 49% of participants had visited green space since the restrictions were enforced on the 23rd of March and 51% hadn't. And this was associated with social grade and dog ownership. So again, you can see that the lower social grade respondents were less likely to have visited green space following the lockdown restrictions being enforced, but dog owners were more likely to have visited than non-dog owners. But I don't think that's too much of a surprise because if you own a dog, you still have to take them out despite any lockdown restrictions. So looking at how visits changed following the lockdown implementation, you can see that 15% of participants reported an increase in visits during the lockdown. And this was associated with social grade and age. So you can see on the plot that the lower social grade respondents were less likely to report an increase in visits than the higher social grade respondents. And those aged 65 plus were less likely than those in the middle age group to report an increase. And we started thinking about why these patterns um, might exist. So potentially the social grade pattern may be linked to how social grade was measured in the survey um, as it was measured by occupation. And those in the lower social grade group were manual workers. So this could include factory workers, delivery drivers, those working in construction. And therefore during the first lockdown, they would have still been out and work, probably not furloughed or working from home, and therefore would have been less likely to have increased their green space visits. And looking at the age 65 plus, this was at a time where those who were at higher risk of contracting COVID-19 were asked to shield from the 21st of March, um, which is more likely to be the old age group, which could be reflected in their green space use. So 63% of participants reported a decrease in visits during the lockdown and 22% reported no difference. And this was linked to sex and age. So females were more likely to report a decrease in visits during the lockdown than males. And those aged 65 plus were less likely to report a were more likely to report a decrease, sorry, than those in the middle age group. And again, this may be to do with shielding and potentially the patterns between male and female could be linked to recent research in the BMJ, finding that females actually make up 77% of the NHS workforce in the UK and 89% of nursing staff. So this could potentially link to the green space use pattern. So looking at one of the experience statements, Participants were asked whether they felt that being in green space benefited their mental health more now, so during the lockdown, than before the restrictions were in place. 
and 65% of participants agreed that green space benefited their mental health more now, so in the lockdown, and this was associated with sex, social grade, dog ownership and age, um, with females more likely to agree, those in the lower social grades group less likely to agree, dog owners less likely to agree, and those age 65 plus less likely to agree. And again, this could be linked to those age 65 plus being more anxious because of shielding um, and being at risk of COVID. And potentially the dog ownership pattern could link to those owning a dog already feeling um, the benefits to their mental health from before lockdown. Um, so it might have had less of an impact. So we decided to conduct a follow-up YouGov survey, um, which was run on the 26th of November 2020, with 2,246 respondents from the same UKGB omnibus. And this is during a time where England and Northern Ireland were in a winter lockdown. However, schools, colleges and universities were still open. In Scotland, almost half of the population were in level four restrictions. And in Wales, they were just out of a fire break lockdown. And we added a few additional questions to this survey. So we asked participants the type of green space they visited in the last four weeks, their frequency of visits, how their visits changed um, in November compared to the stay at home phase of the first survey, and also whether their visits changed um, compared to that time last year. And we also asked some questions around health related reasons for not visiting green space. So I've only added a few of the um, results here as um, we've only just started the analysis on this, but I think it's interesting to look at how patterns have changed um, from the first lockdown to November last year. So when asked if they'd visited any green space in the last four weeks, 65% participants, percent of participants had visited green space and 35% hadn't. So this is quite a big jump um, in percentage compared to the first survey where 49% of participants had visited green space in the last month. And this was significantly associated with social grade, ethnicity and dog ownership. So again, those in the lower social grade group were less likely to have visited green space, same participants were less likely to have visited, but dog owners were more likely to have visited. And looking at change in visits in November compared to during the first lockdown, 25% of participants reported an increase in visits in November compared to the first lockdown, um, which is a bit of a jump from 15% reporting an increase in the first survey compared to before lockdown. And this was associated with age and social grade with older age participants less likely to report an increase and lower social grade respondents less likely to report an increase. And finally, 22% of participants actually reported a decrease in visits in November compared to the first lockdown, with 52% reporting no difference. And only sex was associated with this, with females more likely to report a decrease again, um, which is similar to what we found in the first survey. So I thought um, I'd list just a few of the strengths and limitations of these surveys. So firstly, it was a nationally representative sample of the UK with a range of variables and questions asked around green space use experiences and barriers. And we collected um, the data quite rapidly during the very start of the first lockdown. Therefore, we're able to compare this period of time with the later stages of lockdown. However, we did have to recategorize some of the demographic variables, including ethnicity um, with a relatively small sample for some of the ethnic categories. And we weren't able to analyse all of the individual variables in this analysis, including outdoor garden access or urban and rural location. However, we have got these data, so we're able to analyse them in the future. And the cross-sectional nature of the survey means that we aren't able to establish causality. However, we are able to conduct follow-up surveys as we've already started to do, and we can look at how patterns change in the UK population over time. So I've just put some of the key findings from this here. Um, so firstly, there were socioeconomic inequalities in use that were sustained during the first lockdown, with lower social grade participants less likely to have visited green space before, during and after lockdown. We also found some additional inequality, inequalities in use, with older age individuals and females more likely to report a decrease in green space visits during the first lockdown. And we found similar patterns in use between the first and second waves, um, although we did find large increase in visits in the second wave of the survey. I think the fact that the majority of those that used green space felt that green space benefited the mental health more during the lockdown emphasises the importance of these spaces for health and well-being. And it also reflects how the UK population have found some form of solace in using green space during this time. And this supports the existing research pre-lockdown that highlights the positive influence that spending time in green space can have on the population's well-being. 
So here's a few um, recommendations from a Public Health Scotland report, which was published by my supervisors, Rich and John, um, through Public Health Scotland in October 2020. So we recognise that not everyone used outdoor space more as a result of lockdown, and there were actually marked falls in use amongst some groups, including older people. And this means that we must act upon this and redress the marked reduction in use, especially by older people, and also act to redress underlying socio-economic inequality in use of green space. Although we recognise that those who do use green space feel the benefits on their mental health, meaning that these spaces are an essential resource for community wellbeing and must be protected. And finally, we should act to address the gaps in data and understanding about specific groups not well covered in the current research, which include those of um, an ethnic minority and those with underlying health conditions. So what's the plan now? So we've recently had a paper accepted for publication in BMJ Open, which includes the results from this survey, um, included, and a couple of extra experience statements. We've also got ongoing work with the Environment and Spaces Group at Public Health Scotland, including the report on the previous slide, where there's a link to on here. Um, and we've got further analysis of the second wave being undertaken now with a new report coming out soon. And also for my PhD, I'm using the data from these surveys, as well as a survey um, undertaken by Natural England to look at health conditions and constraints to using green space. So finally, thank you for listening to me today and thank you for having me for the seminar. Um, and thanks to my supervisors, Rich and John for their support and to Natalie Nichols for her help with the statistical analysis for this. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to find the unmute button. <laughs> Thank you very much for a really excellent uh, presentation and a lot of work went into, into this. So it's, it's fantastic work that you presented there. Um, so whew, lots of questions coming in. <laughs> I think the first one that I, that I saw was actually a comment from Desmond um, commenting on the impact of weather. So the first survey wave was in spring, the second one in, um, autumn, but there was still an increase in use of green space. Um, do you have some thoughts on why, like the impact of weather, or why there have been an increase, nevertheless? Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting because actually, um, from some of the analysis we've done on the second survey, um, poor weather was one of the was the top barrier, the highest um, reported barrier of use, even though then there was still an increase in use in November compared to the first lockdown. I think it could be something to do with um, kind of the strictness of the restrictions when we first did the survey, because it was the very first lockdown. Whereas in November, you could see um, that we weren't in, in like a full lockdown where there weren't full restrictions on movement across the UK. Whereas it, in the first survey, it was across the whole of the UK, we're all in lockdown. So I think that may be helped to explain why there was an increase in use in November. But yeah, Paul, I think weather, like in the first lockdown, we had really nice, we had really nice weather, I remember. Um, and November obviously is always a bit dreary, especially in Scotland. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I think weather would have an impact, but potentially the, the increase could be linked to the lockdown restrictions. Great, thank you. A question from um, Megan um, Thompson on, so you looked, you asked participants about their health conditions. And um, did you find or look into whether the presence of a health condition impacted um, on how or if they engaged with green space? Um, I didn't. I didn't in the first in this analysis. So we've we've just started off by looking at who's been using green space um, and the experiences of green space to start with. But for my PhD, I am looking at health conditions um, and use to green use of green space, especially reasons why people may not use green space because poor health is in the top reasons um, for why people don't use green space or use it less frequently. Um, so that's why I think it's important to look at how, how, how poor health impacts on green space use and experiences. And it's important to um, encourage people to use them to improve the health and well-being. But of course, this depends on what type of health condition you have. So that's actually what I'm looking in more depth for my PhD. Um, which I'm going to start the analysis of soon. So maybe you'll hear that in another presentation. <laughs> Great, thank you. Looking forward to that. Um, 
Um, another question from uh, Michelle. Um, so is there evidence that inequalities in green space use increase during the two lockdown periods you examined uh, compared to previously identified inequalities? Or would existing differences in, ac um, in access largely explain the unequal green space usage? So I think that's one of the like, most interesting findings from the analysis so far is just the inequalities in use between the social groups. Um, and and uh, in the uh, studies from before lockdown, there are also inequalities in use between social groups. Um, so you can see that it's been sustained, but I'm not sure if it's been increased. I think it's kind of hard to say that from having different um, populations surveyed, but they were sustained. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You'll see there are more questions coming in the chat, so you might want to uh, respond to them directly. But we have to move on to the third talk to give enough time to uh, Mary to present her research as well. So um, thank you so much, Hannah, for your presentation. You. And we hand over to Mary. <laughs> thank you. Right. Uh, you can see my notes at the moment, can't you? Yes, we can see if you can change to... Better now? Yeah, that's better now, yes. Okay. Um, great, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the health and well-being implications of physical distancing restrictions in Scotland. And I've copied the subtitle thing from Hannah. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let's just quickly recap what happened last year, although you may wish to forget. Um, in On the 24th of March, the population was asked to stay at home apart from necessary journeys like grocery shopping, exercise once a day, and attend work only if it was absolutely impossible to work from home. Um, so that was the start of our first lockdown. And then by the 29th of May, there was a decline of infection and death rates to the point where um, outdoor meetings with one other household could be permitted again. And um, around the time of the 1st of August, um, shielding was also ending. So it slowly, gradually got better or restrictions eased over the summer. Um, and research is already reporting how restrictions have negatively impacted health and well-being. There's a study published earlier in the year from England um, reporting reduced fruit and vegetable intake, reduced physical activity and increased alcohol intake, especially among um, younger people, women and people with a higher BMI. And international research has found increased psychological distress, loneliness, anxiety, depression and suicidal ideation especially among women, young people, and lower socioeconomic groups. However, there's also potential for positive impact on health and well-being. And the same English study also reported increased strength training among the participants they, um, they researched. And a Scottish study found increased physical activity other than walking during the lockdown. And this positive change was maintained as restrictions eased and walking returned to pre-lockdown levels. So therefore, our study wanted to find out or to understand how physical distancing measures impact on people in Scotland over the first six months of the restrictions. Um, and to do this, we interviewed participants longitudinally. Um, so they were interviewed twice, eight weeks apart. And the first wave of our interviews happened um, in late May, early June. And then the second wave of interviews was over August, um, just um, yeah, while we were in phase three out on, on our way out of lockdown. In order to recruit participants, we collaborated with a research company who had already administered a related survey for our team. And we identified eligible participants among the survey respondents who were contacted by the research company. And that allowed us to use a purpose of sampling frame to achieve an even spread across age, sex, health, location, and socioeconomic status. So we had 30 participants in our study. Um, 
around a third of them were younger than 30 years and 17% were aged 70 or older. Just over half were female. Most of them reported white ethnicity and just under half had mental or physical health condition or came from uh, low socioeconomic groups and around about a third resided in urban areas. And the interviews were conducted remotely by phone mostly. One participant was interviewed by video call. Uh, they were audio recorded and transcribed and we took brief notes after each interview. And the interviews covered experiences of adhering to the physical distancing restrictions and other protective behaviours and changes in physical and mental health and health behaviours. And we use longitudinal framework analysis to analyze the transcripts. So we created a framework based on the interview notes and then coded the transcripts according to the framework and compared the coding of the May and June interviews to the August interviews. Um, in terms of changes to health behaviors, we found that participants frequently reported weight gain and that came from a combination of increased snacking and eating more energy dense foods and reduced exercise. So participants explained that they ate more sweets and crisps rather than fruit and veg in response to challenging emotions, but also because they were at home all day and that resulted in greater snacking opportunity and boredom eating. And this was less often reported in August. Um, I have an example from a participant here. When I feel rubbish, I eat rubbish. So I've stopped eating fruit and veg and I'm eating crisps and stuff. And I can obviously feel the effects on my body. And in addition to that, um, people reported reduced exercise due to the movement restrictions. And that was reported, especially um, among lower socioeconomic groups. And there was also a particular problem for those who were shielding because they were vulnerable themselves or had vulnerable family members. Although as restrictions eased, um, reduced exercise was experienced less frequently and the socioeconomic gradient uh, seemed to even out as well. Participants also reported increased exercise at both time points. Um, and in, in August, this was often often as a reason um, weight management was given um, for increasing exercise, as in this example. I've been concentrating on getting the fitness levels back up rather than looking specifically at trying to shed a few pounds, although I have shed a few pounds because I've been doing more exercise. And similarly, healthier diet was re reported predominantly after the restrictions eased and that focused on cooking meals and watching one's diet in order to lose the weight gained during the lockdown. And this woman said, I'm eating a lot healthier actually because during the lockdown, I feel like I've put on weight and I would want to like get rid of that and feel better and feel good about myself. So that's like where we're doing all the healthy eating. Primarily social drinkers um, reported reduced alcohol intake because they were unable to meet people and that's in line with uh, drinking of alcohol being reported again more often in August once people were able to meet others. And increased alcohol intake was also reported, although less often, um, and explained as being able to have um, a drink with a meal that was now taken at home and also in the evenings. In terms of changes to mental well being, increased anxiety was reported by nearly everyone at both interview time points, and that included all participants younger than 30 years and all participants from low socioeconomic groups. And the anxiety was explained as being created by the pandemic itself, but also by consequences of the physical distancing restrictions, such as uncertainty, um, adapting one's behaviors to, to the restrictions, but also from others not following the guidelines and having to work around that. And then also the economic implications of the physical distancing restrictions. Um, as in this example, um, I couldn't see friends, I couldn't go out and just do the most basic of things when seeing people, I couldn't go out for coffee, go to the pub, etc. And for me, that created quite a lot of anxiety, actually. Uh, many participants described feeling restricted throughout the study, although slightly fewer said so in August. And they explained they were unable to make plans, um, they needed something to look forward to or just a change of scenery. Uh, they talked about feeling imprisoned or punished by the physical distancing measures. And nearly five times as many participants described feeling frustrated in August compared to 
May. Um, and this was from not being able to travel or engage in their favorite activities and also from being unable to get some time away from others in their household. But there were also very frequent reports of hope, um, especially among participants over 70. And in, in May and June, participants primarily described feeling hopeful about the future compared to August when participants also mentioned things to look forward to and expecting long-term restrictions to be lighter. An example here, quite optimistic. I think it's going to take a wee while longer, but we're all now getting into the swing of things. So I think the corona will eventually go away, but it's going to be a long time and the economy is starting to build back. So that's a bit healthy looking. So from May to August, we saw an increase in participants reporting improved mental health as the restrictions were being lifted. And when, when we come to uh, healthcare access, we found that most participants reported a willingness to use health services, but from May to August, participants increasingly preferred to avoid health services due to infection risk, as in this example. If I just had to go to the doctor, it'd be fine. A hospital, I'm not too sure I'd want to be there just now. It's just something that's in your head. Well, no, if I go to the hospital, they've got COVID patients there. I might get COVID. And others also wanted to avoid healthcare services um, because they perceived the service as being very busy and they didn't want to add to the burden unless it was absolutely necessary. So about half of our participants had accessed health services at either interview time point and in May and June access was more often remote and usually by, by phone. And participants used dental health services, GP practices, physiotherapy, and prenatal care to get test results, but also to get prescription to manage chronic health conditions or for treatments and advice on acute health issues. And while most participants were happy with their care, they appeared to be less satisfied with their care in August, and with some feeling they needed to get used to telephone appointments, and others thought they received worse care over the phone than they would have in person. A small number of participants were also unable to access health services at either time point. Um, that included being unable to get dental treatment for several months. Um, cancer screening services were suspended, of course, and specialist appointments were cancelled, including tests and treatments for lung cancer and breast cancer. I have a quote for that here. They stopped my injections. I've had my checkups cancelled, and so it's made me feel worried a bit as well, no getting checked up. I would like to have got my mammograms and things done, but just to make sure everything is okay. So in conclusion, the study finds that physical distancing has helped and hindered healthy behaviors, um, especially young people's mental health appears to be impacted by physical distancing restrictions causing anxiety. And while primary care appears to be accessible, um, specialist healthcare access has been impeded or seems to have been impeded by physical distancing. So in the time that I have been analysing our interviews, um, Scotland has seen a gradual return of restrictions with a new lockdown starting on the 5th of January. Um, with a legal requirement to stay at home except for essential shopping, outdoor exercise and so on, and shielding for vulnerable people has been reintroduced. And we can expect to see the issues that we that people reported in May and June to return, but with the potential for impeded coping during the darker and colder months, so people have already said anecdotally that this lockdown seems to be more difficult than the last one. And in, during the first lockdown, many people have been walking and running and cycling, but now the footpaths have become snowy and icy and right now very wet and windy. Um, and so there's the question, has people's ability to exercise changed and how is people's mental health impacted by the decreased opportunity to spend time away from home? Um, and so there is a need for further interviews to assess the continued impact of physical distancing restrictions on physical and mental health and well-being. And that's all from me for now. Um, and we still have a little bit of time for questions, I think. I'll stop sharing now.
Yes, we have some time for questions. Thank you so much, Marie, for your um, presentation. Um, again, fascinating uh, findings that some of them probably resonate with our own experiences as well. Um, so do I see, I don't see any questions for you in the chat yet, but people please <laughs> write your questions. We still have five minutes left. Um, so I thought the finding on um, the perceived quality of care through phone uh, was quite interesting. So um, it's a similar question to what, Laura, um, what, I, what was asked in response to um, Alessio's talk. Is, did you have plans of communicating the findings to, to relevant bodies? I'm just thinking of, I don't know, Royal College of GPs or so, um, primary cares to, to improve care during lockdown or yeah, ongoing restrictions to use of healthcare. Yeah, so the study is funded by the CSO, so we'll certainly be reporting back to them. Um, and it could be could be useful, like you're mentioning um, other bodies that are dire directly bodies of practitioners or for practitioners. Um, I mean, if you want to be cynical, you could also say, well, it's a question of perceived care, the, whether the care has actually got worse or not is a different matter, but I think it is certainly worth flagging up um, and looking further into um, what people's experience is um, of receiving care over the phone or remotely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, any more questions from the audience? Are you all hungry <laughs> or waiting to head off for your lunch um, or your walk, going out for your walk? Um, Ah, I just see the message from Lawrence. Yeah, <laughs> Lawrence thanks all the speakers as well. Um, okay, I mean, I, I, I ask one more question because I'm quite interested also about the findings on the... Um, so it was quite positive findings around the exercising more and also changing uh, cooking habits and preparation, food preparation habits. So do you have plans? I mean, maybe with extra funding to do a similar study now or in the later stages after we are out of this lockdown to see to actually explore the potential changes that you described at the end of your talk um, if they really happened yeah i think it would be really good to access uh funding literally right now because i'd like to know how i'd actually quite like to go back to the participants we did interview to see how they got on over christmas um and in january um, I'm a bit tied up just now, <laughs> but if anybody wants to come and give me a hand or some money, get in touch. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you, Marie. And um, I th also thank again, Alessio and Hannah for your really excellent presentations. Our um, next seminar um, will take place in April sometime, we still have to organize it. <laughs> and you will get an invitation through um, um, Audrey in your um, calendars directly. Um, so yeah, we can't really do an applause, but hopefully we all applause <laughs> Hannah, Alessia and Marie for their fantastic talks. And um, thank you all for your um, questions to the audience. It was really great. Um, engaging questions as well see some some clapping is coming through here <laughs> thank, you. thank you all and and have a good rest of the day and you thank you okay thank bye you. bye everyone bye, -bye. bye.